So, what if dogs could talk? What would the world be like if dogs could talk to us? And not just our pet dogs at home, but working dogs. So assistance dogs, police dogs, search and rescue dogs, medical alert dogs, all have information that they need to give to their handlers. Very important information, often. But they have no way of doing it, really. What if we could create a computer that a dog could operate to send a message to their handler? What would dogs want to say? Well, let's get this out of the way. Yes, dogs would want to talk about squirrels. I'm absolutely certain of that. Uh, but dogs actually have a lot more important things to say than just, look, there's a squirrel. So let's go through some scenarios. Medical alert dogs can detect conditions that might disable their human partner. So an epilepsy dog can detect a seizure before it even happens. And so they're trained to push their owner up against a wall so maybe they don't fall down all the way, they'll slide down the wall. And then once the person is unconscious, they lick their face to try to rouse them, which is wonderful. But what if the dog could pull a tab on his service dog vest that would call 911 through the owner's cell phone and say, by the way, we're at the gym and she just had a seizure, she's unconscious. Or could text a family member to say, we're at the gym, she just passed out, we need help. The dog could actually summon help. Hearing dogs alert by nudging their handler and taking them to the source of the sound. So if someone calls your name, or if you hear the doorbell, or the baby is crying, the dog nudges the person, takes them to the source of the sound. That's phenomenal. But what happens if it's a tornado siren? How does the dog take their handler to the source of a tornado siren? By the way, this is very important information that the tornado siren just went off. But what if the dog could press a button on his service dog vest that would send a text to the owner's cell phone or a message to their head-mounted display that would say, tornado siren just went off. This allows the person to make a much better decision about how to respond. Police dogs, military dogs, do in incredibly important functions when they're doing bomb sniffing. And the dogs are trained to respond to a variety of scents. So there are a lot of different kinds of explosives, a lot of different kinds of accelerants. They're trained to respond to all of them. And they alert, and they say, I found an explosive. That dog knows what he is smelling. And he knows whether it is C4, which is a nice, stable, well, nice for an explosive, stable, uh, can be handled, isn't going to explode if you touch it? Or is that TATP, which if you bump it, it's dangerously explosive? The bomb squad would probably like to know that. The dog does know it. What if he could touch a sensor on either side of his vest to say, dangerous, not dangerous? Could be life saving. Search and rescue dogs also perform vital functions. And since dogs are so much faster than humans, they typically work at a distance from their handler. So the handler says, go sweep that area. The dog takes off, and often they are out of voice or hand signal range. So the handler can't necessarily see what the dog is doing. When the dog finds his target, they do what's called a recall and refine. So since the handler is so much slower, the dog has to say, oh, found the target, run back to the handler to find the handler, lead the handler back to the target, but about three months ago, we had a young man on the autism spectrum get lost in the North Georgia mountains. And every time the dogs got near, he would run away. So every time the dog found the target, came back to his handler, came back to where he was, he was gone. So what if a search and rescue dog could find his target and then bite a sensor on his vest that geolocated, says, here's my exact GPS coordinates, and that gets sent to the handler, to the medical team standing by, and the frantic parents, all at the same time. Found him, and I'm going to follow him. The dog stays with the person, never has to refind his handler, and everybody can find them all at once. So we created a project called FIDO, which stands for Facilitating Interactions for Dogs with Occupations. I apologize, that is a backronym. Sorry about that. But FIDO is easier to say than all of that. Um, so we are creating wearable technologies for working dogs 
that allows a working dog to activate sensors on a wearable vest that gives information back to their handler. We use a little tiny microprocessor on the, on the back of the dog's vest that allows you to do pretty much anything a computer can do. We can send a text message, we can create a, a sound, we can send something through Bluetooth. So it's, there's, it's very powerful. And we base the sensors that the dogs activate on natural abilities of dogs, because dogs are pretty clever. So one thing that dogs can do right off the bat, even when they're puppies, is tug. And you can see my naughty little puppy tugging the string of his, his friend's vest there, trying to get it off. Dogs do this completely on their own. But this also translates later in life in a service dog to very useful skills, such as opening a door or opening a mailbox or pulling socks off. So service dogs are almost always trained with a precision tug. So it's very controlled, very precise tug. So we use that natural ability to create a sensor that's based on tugging. This is a Sky showing us how he can tug what's essentially a commercial dog toy attached to a stretch sensitive resistor. So when he pulls that dog toy, the, the stretch resistor responds and says, okay, this is how much force was applied. We measure that force, we threshold it, and we can uh, activate the sensor. Very successful sensor that we, uh, we tested. Biting and holding is another very natural thing that dogs do is my little Papillon laser here holding a Frisbee that's bigger than he is. This is something that's not hard to get dogs to do. So we developed a series of bite sensors and we started with, this is called a, an oval bite sensor. It's two halves of a plastic sensor with a force sensitive uh, resistor inside. So it measures the force and Schubert is showing us here how it can be activated. He squeezes the sides of it together and it sends a signal to the computer and we can tell that he's bitten it. Unfortunately though, since this has two halves, he had to bite it in exactly the right way. If they held it sideways, it wouldn't activate. Now the dogs are brilliant. We tested uh, nine dogs on this. They all figured out eventually how to rotate the sensor in their mouths to get the right orientation, but that was too hard. So we tried again for a uh, force sensitive bite sensor. And this is Joss modeling our, uh, our new sensor that has four uh, force resistors, uh, sensitive resistors on it. Um, and this worked much better. The dogs didn't have to figure out how to orient it. But the problem was when you have that many moving parts, it becomes quite fragile. So dogs with powerful jaws just kind of crush the thing. So speaking of powerful jaws, this is our pit bull, Henry, one of our test pilots. And we developed a new sensor pretty much because Henry was able to destroy the four-sided bite sensor that was a little bit more robust. This is called a pneumatic sensor. It's a rubber tube sealed at both ends with a barometer inside. So as the dog squeezes the, the tube, the barometer registers the increase in air pressure and we get an activation. Henry couldn't even destroy this. It was awesome. Unfortunately, the thing that destroyed this was low barometric pressure. I took it into an airplane, should have taken it on board with me and killed it. So this is very sensitive to changes in, in the air, the air pressure, et cetera. So we said, all right, we need something that's even more robust than this. So this is DART showing us how to activate a capacitive sensor. So a capacitive sensor reacts to something that's conductive, like your, your skin or a dog's nose or their mouth. So anything with water in it will uh, activate a capacitive sensor. This thing was tough. It was easy for the dogs to activate. They couldn't destroy it. Awesome. We put it on a search and rescue dog, and I sent one of my uh, research assistants out through the woods you know, to do an exercise, and we found out that a, a search and rescue dog will not go around a lake, they will go through the lake. <laughs> Oops. So the capacitive sensor is like alerting, alerting, like, okay, we need to figure out how to do that, and we're working on that right now as a, a way to keep the capacitive sensor uh, when, when you're in a water situation or a rain situation that it won't accidentally activate. The last natural ability that we've taken advantage of here is nose touching. Uh, my little Papillon laser is a movie actor, uh, TV, TV actor, and uh, to position them on screen, we teach them to, to come to where my hand is. So this is a very th natural thing to, to teach a dog. Dogs explore the world with their noses, so they like to touch things with their noses. It's not hard at all to teach them that. So we developed a sensor very similar to the paper towel dispenser in the bathrooms here. 
Wave your hand over it, spits out a paper towel. Well, 50% of the time, so it spits out a paper towel. Uh, our sensor works much better than that. Uh, our original concept was that the dogs would reach around and touch that sensor with their noses, but all by themselves, dogs are brilliant, they figured out that all they had to do was wave their nose over it, just like we do to the paper towel dispenser. And so this became a gesture sensor, not necessarily a nose touch sensor, because they're so brilliant. But this is one of our most successful uh, sensors. It is very easy to activate. Problem with this one is if you get too close to a piece of furniture, sometimes it can activate. We're working on making that a little bit more robust as well. Now one of the side effects of this uh, we did a formal study with nine different sensors, eight different dogs, tested all of them on all the sensors, and we found out when we were analyzing the data, a surprise. And in research, we love this aha moment. Surprise, look at that. Wow, that's weird. Um, the top graph here, all those spikes are activations. So that's the amount of force applied to a bite sensor. The top dog and the top graph represents a dog with medium drive. He's very even-tempered. He's obviously very smart, all of them are, but he's very even-tempered, he's very, very obedient. He's doing exactly what I asked him to do. I asked him to activate that sensor 10 times. He did exactly what I asked him to do. The middle graph shows a dog who was trained as an assistance dog, but he was released because he's too what we call soft. He's too gentle, he's lot, not really motivated enough, he he's just doesn't have a lot of drive. And we thought he wasn't able to activate the sensor, but when we looked at the data, he was trying to activate it. It was just so soft that we couldn't read it. So, so it showed, you know, that was completely a picture of his temperament. The bottom graph shows a picture of our overachiever dog, who's incredibly high drive, and he bit it about 100 times in the same space that the other dogs bit it 10 times. So we said, this is a picture of their temperament. And we now have a grant to study this, to go forward, uh, to see, can we predict success as a service dog? Maybe that top dog is going to be a really nice service dog for someone with a physical disability. The middle dog probably would not be a good service dog. He just doesn't have enough drive. And the bottom dog might make a phenomenal service dog for someone who has a lot of physical ability or maybe a search and rescue dog or a police dog that needs more drive. But we can tell that at a very early age because they're just biting a sensor. The other side of this coin so we have dogs talking to people, but what about people talking to dogs? Communication is two-way. So what if you're in a crowded theater, and at my house this is what a crowded theater looks like. Um, what if you're in a crowded theater and your service dog stands up and you need to give him a command? And usually it's gonna be a, a verbal command. You have to say, down. Well, you don't wanna do that in the middle of the opera. So what if you could give him a silent command, or you're in a work meeting, you don't necessarily wanna be talking to your dog. Give him a silent command. Um, or a military dog is usually handled with hand signals, big hand signals, which makes the person a sniper target. Search and rescue dogs work at a distance. They can't get commands from their handler at all. So what if you could send it to them remotely? So we created a bodysuit for dogs that's called a haptic interface, haptic meaning touch. The suit has inside of it six different vibrating motors that, that give the dog different commands based on just feeling. We can vibrate the motor, the dog knows that the vibrating motor on your chest means lie down. And we can actually command the dog remotely, even out of sight, and of course silently. And we've tested this with a number of dogs, even my little tiny dog here. They all learn this within a matter of minutes. It's impressive how quickly they understand this. So I have the world's first remote control Papillon. Very proud of that. But when you're at home, dogs usually, service dogs, assistance dogs, don't typically wear their service dog vests. They're just like us. They like to be comfortable. They want to put on their pajamas. They don't necessarily want to uh, have to wear something at home. And my grandmother, who was in her 90s, we bought her one of those medical alert necklaces that you wear to you know, summon help if you fall down. But she didn't like wearing it. So it lived on her bedstand. And I would always say, Grandmommy, what if you fall down in the kitchen? She said, I'll roll to my bedroom. <laughs> and knowing my grandmother, she probably would. But I said, you know what? What if her little poodle could go to a touch screen on the wall and touch a series of icons with his nose and tell the neighbor next door, you know what? Eleanor just fell down. Or what if they could text me and I could drive to Alabama 
to, to help her, or even 911. So we're working also with virtual interfaces for dogs in the form of touch screens. Um, and dogs, it turns out, are very good at understanding patterns of activation. Uh, some of the technical challenges with this are that dogs' noses are wet. And when we started with capacitive screens, dog slobber became a very important uh, confound. Um, so now we're looking at infrared beams that we can break, et cetera. But it was an interesting design challenge to figure out how a dog can uh, interact with a touch screen without messing up the touch screen. So one last story. This is Wallace and her service dog, Caspin. And as you can see, Wallace uses a wheelchair. So he does a lot of things for her, such as picking up things that she drops, opening doors for her. He pulls her socks off at night. Uh, he also pulls the wheelchair. Uh, but one of, the, one of the issues that they have is Caspin, uh, or Wallace is very soft-spoken. She can't speak very loudly, part of her condition. And so she can't summon help. If, if something happens, she can't yell for help. And one day she took Caspin to a dog park, and they were having a great time, and she got her wheelchair stuck. And she, she told Caspin to bark with a hand signal, and he was barking, but they were at a dog park. So nothing happened. No one could tell that they were in trouble. So the Fido team uh, invented a vest for her, and I'm going to invite my colleague, two of my colleagues, Barbara Courier, who's a professional dog trainer, and her service dog, Blitz, who is now going to upstage me completely. <laughs> uh, Barbara actually um, has a condition where her blood sugar and her, her blood pressure can drop, and Blitz is trained to alert to that. And so we were going through an airport and going to Zurich together uh, one last year, and her blood sugar started to drop, and I was already through security. So he's tried to alert to the TSA agents who thought, well, that is a very uh, interesting dog. Uh, he's very, very, very friendly. And he's trying to say, hey, my mom needs help. So this is a vest that would have helped Blitz in this situation, and I'm going to let him tell you about it. So this is what would have happened had we been able to have this vest then. Excuse me. My owner needs your attention. So, I think you Excuse just... Excuse me. My owner needs your attention. You, you've just witnessed TED history. I believe he's the first dog to speak at a TED conference. So what if dogs could talk? How would this change the world? Well, we know that dogs have information that their handlers need to know. And we hope our FIDO team can create technologies that will make humans safer and possibly even save lives. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.